Chapter 1 The Heart of the Matter Nature has taken good care that theory should have little effect on practice. Samuel Johnson 21-year-old Helen was brought to my clinic by her worried aunt. Ellen was dangerously underweight and getting thinner by the day. She was a tall girl, 185 centimeters in height, over 6 feet, with a weight of 51 kilograms, 8 stone. She obviously used to be quite beautiful, but now she looked emaciated and pale. Her eyes were dull and her voice feeble. Her menstruations had stopped seven months ago. Helen grew up abroad and came to England to study at university. Back home, processed foods were not available, so Helen was brought up on home-cooked wholesome meals made from fresh, locally produced ingredients. Fresh meat, fresh eggs, and fresh whole milk constituted a large percentage of her diet. She was always very healthy. When she came to England, she soon developed a dislike for the processed junk diets her fellow students lived on and decided to eat a healthy diet. Brief research and popular literature led her to the idea that the healthiest diet is a vegetarian, low-fat one. So Helen started cooking her own meals out of whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, lots of vegetables, and fruit. She drank only water and fruit juices. The only fat she had was some olive oil and peanut butter. She consumed no animal foods at all and tried to eat everything organic. After a few months on this diet, Helen's menstruation stopped and she started losing weight. But none of it seemed to worry her as she felt well. When she went home for a visit, her family were horrified by the way she looked and contacted her aunt in England to ask for help. By the time of the consultation, Helen had been on her healthy diet for more than a year. So what happened to Helen? Didn't she follow the healthiest diet in the world and the one we should all strive for? That is what some authorities and the mainstream media are telling us. Let us try and understand the whole issue. Helen is an intelligent girl and the first good thing she did was stop eating all processed foods. These man-made concoctions wrapped in colorful packaging have no right to be called by the noble name food. They are at the root of all modern epidemics of degenerative disease. We will not devote any time to processed foods here. I would sum them up with a great quote from Zoe Harcomb. Man is the only species clever enough to make his own food and the only one stupid enough to eat it. To have good health, we need to eat foods created by Mother Nature, not man. Mother Nature took billions of years to design our bodies while at the same time designing all the foods suitable for our bodies to use. How arrogant it is for humans to think that they know better than Mother Nature after having tinkered in their laboratories for a few decades. Mother Nature has provided us with two groups of food, plant foods and animal foods. These two groups work differently in the body and both are important. Human beings are omnivores. We have evolved on this planet eating everything we could find in our immediate environment from both plants and animals. That is what several researchers have confirmed in their extensive study of traditional cultures around the world. The most prominent and thorough research has been conducted by Weston A. Price, an American dentist. He spent many years at the beginning of the 20th century traveling around the world to places where indigenous traditional cultures still existed. The aim of his research was to see what effect diet has on human health. At the time, chronic diseases were rampant in the civilized world, and it was clear that food had something to do with that. Vegetarianism was gaining popularity in America and Europe. So when Weston A. Price set off for his travels, he was specifically looking for healthy, exclusively vegetarian cultures. No matter how hard he searched, he did not find one. 
In every corner of our planet, healthy indigenous people ate a mixture of plants and animal foods, and it is the animal foods that were the most valued. Let us have a look at these two groups of natural foods in more detail. How does it work? All energy on our beautiful planet gets recycled while new energy comes from the sun. In order to capture the energy of the sun and convert it into solid matter, Mother Nature has designed plants. Plants have a process called photosynthesis which captures the sunlight and converts it into chlorophyll, building the plant matter. A plant in your garden can almost double in size on a sunny day. That is how efficient it is in changing the energy of the sun into solid matter which we can touch and eat. The next group of creatures on the planet that consume the energy of the sun in the form of plants are herbivorous animals, animals designed to eat plant matter. Cows, sheep, goats, giraffes, buffalo, elk, deer, and camels. Plants are generally difficult to digest. The only creatures that can do it well are microbes. They have incredible abilities to ferment carbohydrates, break down proteins, starch and fiber, release vitamins, and generally turn the plant matter into a form that other creatures can benefit from. This is exactly what Mother Nature used to help the herbivorous animals to digest plants and extract nutrients from them. Mother Nature equipped them with a very special digestive system called a rumen. It is very large with several stomachs full of plant breaking microbes that digest the plants for the animal. A rumen is a very busy place where the microbes work on the plant matter grass, for example, for a while and then send it back into the mouth of the animal to be chewed again. The animal regurgitates it. After chewing the grass a bit more, the animal swallows it for further digestion. This is called chewing the cud and an herbivorous animal can chew the same mouthful of plant matter many times, sending it back and forth between the mouth and the rumen, about 200 times in a cow. In the rumen, carbohydrates from plants get broken down and a large percentage of them is converted into saturated fat, short chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butrate. So the herbivorous animals are actually living on a high fat diet and most of this fat is saturated. This fat is a main source of energy production for these animals. The rumen has a very diverse population of microbes, including bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, and worms. All of these creatures participate in digesting the plant matter for the animal and converting it into a mixture of nutrients which the animal's digestive system can absorb. The rumen of herbivorous animals is a beautiful example of how everything in nature works in cooperation, in harmony with each other. In order to consume the energy of the sun in the form of herbivorous animals, Mother Nature has designed the next group of life, predators. Wolves, lions, tigers, foxes, cats, dogs, etc cannot digest plant matter because they are equipped with a very different digestive system. They can only digest meat and other animal foods. The human digestive system in its structure is similar to the gut of predatory animals. We have one small stomach with virtually no microbes in it. As in predatory anim animals, our human stomach is designed to produce acid and pepsin which are only able to break down meat, fish, milk, and eggs. Our stomach is designed perfectly to digest animal foods. Plants, however, do not digest in our stomach to any degree. They have to wait to move out of the stomach into the intestines where pancreatic enzymes and bile are added to the mix to break down the food further. But even when 
Even there, the plants don't digest well. We can only break down a small part of cooked starch and absorb some juices, sugars, and vitamins. The bulk of the plant, the fiber, and the most starch is indigestible for the human gut. It goes through the intestines and then lands in the bowel, which is the equivalent of the rumen in the human body. This is where the majority of our gut flora resides. Bacteria, fungi, predosia, viruses, worms, and other creatures work on the plant matter and extract from it what they can. They break down some starch and fiber and convert them into short chain fatty acids, B vitamins, vitamin K2, and other useful substances for us, the same way they do in the rumen of herbivorous animals. The difference between the herbivorous animals and us is that their rumen is at the beginning of their gut, while our rumen, the bowel, is at the end. In herbivorous animals, the plant matter is digested well in the rumen before it moves down in the part of the gut where absorption of nutrients happens. In humans, the bulk of our food absorption happens higher up in the intestines where plants cannot be digested. So the nutrients that we absorb in the intestines come largely from animal foods which were digested well in the stomach. In short, the bulk of the nutrition that our body thrive, our bodies thrive on comes from animal foods. People knew this fact through experience for millennia. They knew that the most nourishing foods for them came from animals. They would eat plants as a supplement to meat or when animal foods were in short supply. We have been talking about natural plants, fresh vegetables and fruit unprocessed grains, natural beans and pulses, seeds, nuts, and herbs. Processed plant matter, particularly things made out of flour and sugar, have a very different digestive digestion pattern. They have been pre-digested for us by our food industry. Our gut has very little work to do to digest them, so they absorb very well and quite quickly. These foods are a major cause of all human degenerative diseases in the civilized world. But what about all the research published in popular nutrition books which shows that plants are full of nourishment? Yes, when we analyze different plant foods in a laboratory, they show good amounts of vitamins, proteins, fats, and minerals. This information is then published in common nutritional literature, causing confusion. Why? Because in a laboratory, we can use all sorts of methods and chemicals for extracting nutrients from plants, methods that our human digestive system does not possess. The human gut has a very limited ability to digest plants and to extract useful nutrients from them. In the past, people knew that plant foods are hard for humans to digest. That is why all traditional cultures have developed methods of food preparation to extract more, nutrient, more, more nutrition from plants and to make them more digestible, such as fermentation, malting, sprouting, and cooking. Unfortunately, in our modern world, many of these methods have been forgotten and replaced with recipes that suit the food industry's commercial agenda. If we cook and prepare plant foods properly, can't we live on them? This is exactly what Helen tried to do. She prepared all her food at home from natural plant ingredients. She cooked rice, oats, quinoa, and buckwheat. She made her own bread, she cooked beans and lentils, she snacked on nuts and fruit, and consumed lots of vegetables. Why did she get in into trouble? Let us see. The human body without water is largely made out of protein and fat, about half and half. These are the bricks and mortar from which your bones, muscles, brain, heart, lungs, liver, and all other organs are made. Laboratory analysis of plants and animal foods shows that the best protein and fat for human structure and physiology 
come from animal foods. The amino acid profile of animal protein is correct for the human body, while the amino acid profile of plant-derived proteins is incomplete and unsuitable for human physiology. The same with fat. Animal fat has the right fatty acid composition for the human body to thrive on, while plant oils are unsuitable. So when it comes to feeding your body and building your bodily tissues and structures, animal foods are the best and the only suitable ones. The human body has a wonderful process which goes on from the moment of conception until death called cell regeneration. Cells in your body and all of your organs and tissues constantly grow old, die, and are replaced by newly born cells. This way the body maintains itself, rejuvenates itself, and heals any damage. In order for your body to give birth to those baby cells to replace the old ones, building materials are needed. Proteins and fats. The best building materials to feed your cell regeneration process come from animal foods, meats, fish, eggs, and dairy. Growing children need large amounts of building materials for their bodies, not only for cell regeneration, but for growth. So animal foods must be, very, must be a very important part of their diet. Apart from nutrition, animal products provide the body with energy. In fact, contrary to popular beliefs, the best source of energy for most cells in your body is fat. One of the hungriest organs in the human body is the brain. It sponges up around 25 to 45 percent of all nutrition floating in your blood. Your body spends a lot of effort on feeding the brain 24 hours a day, every day. Contrary to popular beliefs, there is much more your brain needs than just energy in the form of glucose. It is a physical organ and its cell regeneration processes require feeding with good quality protein and fat. The brain is a very fatty organ so it requires a lot of good quality fat to maintain its structure. On top of that, your brain manufactures neurotransmitters, hormones, and hundreds of other active molecules which are largely proteins. The brain needs building materials to make them from. The best building materials to feed your brain come from animal foods. In the clinical practice, we see degeneration of the brain function in people on purely plant-based diets. First, the sense of humor goes. The person becomes black and white in their thinking and behavior. The sharpness of the mind goes. Memory and learning abilities suffer. Depression sets in and other mental problems follow. These are all signs of a starving brain. The study of traditional indigenous people confirms the fact that animal foods are essential for us. In this article about the South Seas Islanders and Florida Indians, published in 1935, Weston A. Price has given a very interesting explanation of cannibalism in humans. The people on the islands were divided into two groups, the coastal people who lived by the sea and ate a lot of seafood, and the hill people who lived high in the hills in the middle of the islands and had only plants available for them to eat. The two groups exchanged foods. However, when the, people down, when the people from the hills did not get enough seafood for a while, their health suffered. To remedy their health problems, they would come down to the coast and kill and eat coastal people. They knew from experience that the coastal people's organs, the liver in particular, had all the necessary nutrients for them because the coastal people ate lots of fish and shellfish. They especially targeted fishermen because people with this profession ate more seafood and their organs were particularly nutritious. Weston A. Price interviewed one fisherman who had to flee his home because he was told that the hill people had chosen him as their next victim. This example from human history shows us again that, humans, that human beings cannot live without animal foods. 
The coastal people lived happily on their seafood. They had no thoughts about eating other people. But the hill people could not live on their plants alone. They had to supplement their diet with seafood to survive. And when they did not get enough, they were prepared to take drastic actions. This is just another example of what people are capable of when they are truly hungry. And the true hunger is always for animal foods. Can we live on animal foods alone? Many people would be surprised to hear that human beings can live exclusively on animal foods. In my clinic, I have patients who live entirely on animal foods with great results, both children and adults. Patients with ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and severe mental illness do very well on a no plant gaps diet. Not a leaf, not a speck of anything from the plant kingdom is consumed. These people live on meats, including organ meats, animal fats, meat stock, and bone broth. Fish, including shellfish and mollusks. Fish stock, fresh eggs, and fermented raw dairy. Kefir, sour cream, ghee, butter, cheese, and yogurt. In some severe cases of ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease, this is the only diet that allows patients to be well, stop all medication, reach their normal body weight, eliminate all digestive symptoms, and function to their full capacity. In severe cases of bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and other psychiatric conditions, this diet can be a savior. Some of these people have lived on this diet for three years or longer and have no desire to change their eating habits because this diet works for them. Some have tried to add a little vegetable or fruit to their regimen and found that their symptoms started returning, so they had to stop. So based on my clinical experience, I have no doubt that human beings can live very healthily without plant foods at all. Living entirely on animal foods is not new to our planet. Weston A. Price, found that one of the healthiest groups of traditional so-called primitive people were Maasai warriors in Africa who ate no plant matter at all. They were nomadic people traveling with their cattle and everything they ate was provided by their animals. They ate meat, organ meats, milk, and sour milk, and they drank the blood of their bulls. When they were asked why they didn't eat the fruit found in their habitat, they laughed and answered that fruit was food for their cows. These people had none of the diseases of our modern civilized world whatsoever. No heart disease, no cancer, no degenerative conditions. Their bodies were trim and muscular. Their lifespan was long and they had beautiful healthy teeth. In addition to perfect physical health, these people were intelligent, joyful, peaceful, friendly, and happy, with no psychological problems at all. But when some of them moved to a city and adopted a modern diet, they started getting the same diseases people suffer from in any modern country. So the fact is, humans can live without plants. However, we cannot live without animal foods. What are plants for? What about all the plant-based diets shown to help with chronic disease? Why are cold pressed good quality plant oils shown to be beneficial for so many degenerative conditions? Supplementing these oils is promoted by both the mainstream and alternative medical community. What about all the antioxidants, enzymes, vitamins, minerals, bioflavonoids and other substances in plants that are shown to be beneficial to health. Not a month passes without science discovering that broccoli has anti-cancer properties, cabbage has substances that heal the digestive system, nuts reduce the risk of heart disease, etc, etc. Here we come to the real purpose of eating plants. They are cleansers. While they are unable to feed our bodies to any serious degree, they are wonderful at keeping us clean on the inside. They also provide energy for the body to use in form of glucose and some cofactors in the form of vitamins and minerals, but their main purpose is to keep your body clean and free of toxins. 
Indeed, plants in their natural fresh state are equipped with powerful detoxifying substances, which can remove various man-made chemicals, pollution, and other toxins that we accumulate in our bodies. Plants are particularly powerful cleansers when consumed raw. These juices absorb in the upper parts of the digestive system, contribute, contributing a plethora of detoxifying substances and cofactors. Juicing of raw organic greens, vegetables, and fruit is a major part of any cleansing protocol. When the plant matter moves further down in the gut, the fiber and starch feed the gut flora in the bowel. However, the problem with fiber and starch is that they feed equally the bad and the good microbes. So how good this plant matter is for the person depends on the composition of his or her gut flora. If the flora is healthy, then the fiber and starch will do you good. If your flora is unhealthy, the plant matter will feed the pathogens in your gut, which will flourish and produce many toxins and do a lot of damage. GAP's nutritional protocol is designed to normalize the gut flora and repair the gut. We remove all starch and fiber from the diet of the person in the initial stages, which is essential to allow their gut to heal. When we cook plants, we reduce their cleansing ability, but make them more digestible, so they provide some building materials for the body to use. Unfortunately, these materials cannot build the body to any degree. They are largely carbohydrates which the body uses for producing energy and then stores any surplus as fat. When plants are severely processed, grains in particular, they provide the wrong materials for the body, causing disease. They overload the body with sugars, breaking some of the most fundamental mechanisms in our metabolism. This is why consumption of products made out of flour and sugar, very processed plants, is a major cause of pretty much all degenerative health problems in our modern world. Weight gain, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and other forms of dementia, psychological and neurological problems in children and adults, infertility, polycystic ovaries, immune abnormalities, etc. Mounting research shows that another constitution, constituent of grains, plant proteins, is becoming positively dangerous for a growing proportion of humanity. Gluten is wheat and other cereals. Zane and corn, sicklin and rye, hordin and barley, and avenin and oats. The reason for this is that a growing number of people have damaged gut flora. In a person with abnormal gut flora, grain proteins don't digest properly and absorb in the form of peptides, which trigger chronic systemic inflammation, autoimmunity, and food allergies and intolerances. Treatment of every chronic illness, from rheumatoid arthritis to cancer, and from heart disease to mental illness, must begin by removing all grains from the diet and everything made from them. A cleaner body always feels better than a toxic one. That is why so many people feel well on a plant-based diet in the first few weeks. One can read glowing testimonies in vegan and vegetarian books to that effect, but when the body has finished cleansing, you need to start feeding it with animal foods. If that point is missed, the body starts starving and deteriorating. What happened to Helen? With her vegan diet, she was cleansing herself and cleansing herself and cleansing herself until she literally got washed out. She missed the point when her body had finished cleansing and needed to start feeding. That is why she lost so much weight despite eating large amounts of grains, beans, nuts, fruit, vegetables, and vegetable oils. This diet, considered to be very healthy in our modern society, was not feeding her to any degree. Helen's menstruation stopped after a few months on this diet. Why did that happen? Clearly her body was starving and conserving whatever precious resources it had left 
it could not afford to waste them on monthly menstruations. But the biggest reason was lack of hormone production in Helen's body. Sex hormones are manufactured by our bodies from molecules of cholesterol. There is no cholesterol in plants. It comes only from animal foods. The human body can produce cholesterol, but in a person with nutritional deficiencies, the body is not able to do it efficiently. As a result, production of all steroid hormones, including sex hormones, can become low. Without sex hormones, there can be no menstruation or any other functioning of the reproductive system in humans. This fact has been discovered and exploited by various religious orders through the centuries because monks and nuns were not allowed to have any sexual activity. Their sexual energy was a problem for them, so they looked for ways to reduce it. They found that a plant-based diet achieved this aim very effectively. Sexual desire and fertility were dramatically reduced. This may be good news for nuns and monks, but for a young person such as Helen, who is hoping to have a family one day, it is very bad news indeed. Infertility in the Western world is a big problem. Many young couples are unable to produce children. There is no doubt that the mainstream push for plant-based and low-fat diets is an important reason for this epidemic. Clinical experience shows that when these couples change their diet and start consuming plenty of animal foods with normal or high fat content, a large percentage of them conceive a child. Recent research agrees with this observation. Researchers found that women who drink whole milk and eat high fat dairy products are more fertile than those who stick to low fat products. Dr. Jorge Chavarro of the Harvard School of Public Health, who led the study published in Human Reproduction in 2007, emphasized, women wanting to conceive should examine their diet. They should consider changing low-fat dairy foods for high-fat dairy foods, for instance, by swapping skim milk for whole milk and eating cream, not low-fat yogurt. These high-fat foods provide good amounts of cholesterol to be converted into sex hormones so necessary for having children. Vegan diets, plant-only diets, should be seen as a form of fasting. They do not feed the body properly, but provide it with a lot of cleansing. While your digestive system is busy processing plant matter so you don't feel hungry, the diet will provide your body with large amounts of cleansing substances. The ultimately toxic people are cancer victims. They require a lot of cleansing. That is why many nutritional cancer treatment protocols are vegan. However, followed as a permanent lifestyle, veganism often leads to developing cancers because the body simply runs out of resources to look after itself. When your body has finished cleansing, it will need feeding, and that is when you have to introduce animal foods. If that is not done, the body starves, starts cannibalizing itself, and problems start developing. What happened to Helen is a good example of that. When visiting India, I met some Hindu pilgrims traveling to their sacred religious sites. Part of their pilgrimage is a 41-day fast, which they described as very difficult. They are not allowed to eat any animal foods at all and live entirely on plants. Vegetables, fruit, rice, lentils, and beans, and nuts, vegetable oils, and bread, precisely the Western vegan diet. These people consider it to be a fast, not a diet, and do it very rarely as part of a religious pilgrimage. So when talking about purely plant-based eating, the word diet should not be used. Instead, such a regimen should be called a vegan fast. One cannot fast forever. Like any other form of fasting, Veganism can only be used as a temporary measure to cleanse the body. It must never be chosen as a permanent lifestyle. Vegetarian diets that include animal foods can be adopted as a long-term strategy. 
It is possible to be a healthy vegetarian as long as you continue eating some animal foods to provide feeding building substances for your body, such as plenty of eggs and full fat dairy. Obviously, all processed foods should be removed and the diet needs to be natural. Such vegetarian cultures exist in India. People there understand just how valuable animal foods are for them. That is why the cow is considered to be a sacred animal in India. She provides milk, butter, cheese, and ghee. And ghee. Apart from cows, people in India keep goats and highly value their milk. Many vegetarians in India also keep chickens and ducks and consume plenty of fresh eggs. Many consume meat and fish when they can get them. There are many forms of vegetarianism. Some eat fish, some eat eggs and dairy, some allow occasional consumption of meat. People who get into trouble are those who decide to stop eating meat and live largely on processed foods. They get ill very quickly. This group of people is particularly prone to diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and cancer. Another group of people who get into trouble are those who follow low-fat vegetarianism. A lot of impetus for removing fats from the diet comes from counting calories because fats produce the highest amount of calories per gram. The idea that you can equate Mother Nature's food to calories is a shameful indictment on nutritional science. Food is not a calorie, it is a million times more complicated and interesting. The human body is not a furnace for burning calories either. It is also a million times more complex. Looking at food in terms of calories is just another example of how lost and inadequate our food science is. Human beings cannot live without fats. Mother Nature took billions of years to design our bodies, to design our foods, and everything she put into them is essential, including fat. Every component is a natural food, and a natural food is balanced with all other components. They work as a whole. To remove fat from a natural food is to make it incomplete and unbalanced. The human body cannot thrive on such food. Low-fat vegetarianism typically leads to degenerative diseases of the nervous system and immunity. Mental illness, particularly anorexia nervosa, is one of the very common results of this regimen. Let us summarize this chapter. There are two groups of natural foods on our beautiful planet, and each of them has its own role to play in human physiology. Animal foods, meat, fish, eggs, and dairy, are largely building feeding foods. They feed the cell regeneration in the body, allowing the body to maintain its normal physical structure and chemical composition. In other words, animal foods provide the bricks and mortar your body is made from. Apart from that, your body manufactures a myriad of protein-based chemicals every day hormones, enzymes, neurotransmitters, and others that are essential for your body to function. In fact, your body can be seen as a chemical factory of sorts. The raw materials this factory needs come from animal foods. Animal foods are particularly important for growing children as their bodies need large amounts of building materials for growth and development. These foods are absolutely essential for a pregnant woman to consume because she's building a body for her baby. Building materials are needed for that and the mother must do her best to provide the best building materials she can find. Following a vegan fast during pregnancy can be absolutely disastrous for the child and the mother. But even vegetarianism where parents eat Dairy products and eggs may not provide optimal nutrition for the child. I have seen a number of vegetarian families in my clinic where children suffer from autism, diabetes type 1, allergies, anemia, and many other health problems. In all cases, the children were malnourished and the parents were malnourished too. 
plant foods, grains, beans, fruit, vegetables, herbs, nuts, and seeds are good foods for cleansing and detoxifying, but they do not feed the body to any serious degree. They keep the body clean on the inside by helping it remove toxins and wastes. They provide energy for the body in the form of glucose. They provide some micro elements for the body to use. Minerals, vitamins, phytonutrients, and cofactors. They feed the gut flora in the bowel and allow it to produce many useful nutrients for us. B vitamins, vitamin K2, short chain fatty acids, and other useful substances. However, plant foods cannot be used successfully as the only source of food. Of course, this division is not black and white. There are some overlap. Animal products, particularly raw, have a considerable cleansing ability while plants have some feeding ability, particularly when cooked, fermented, and sprouted. So let us enjoy both the animal foods and the plant foods working in harmony for our bodies. The important thing is to keep them natural with minimal processing. In order for us to find the best quality natural foods, we must know where our food comes from. In the next chapter, we're going to look at how food is produced in our modern world and the implications of plant-based diets for our diet for our planet Earth.